Okay, we're back in the room, guys. Come and grab a seat. Uh, the amazing Jacob is going to come and read uh, the, mo- uh, the morning scripture for us. Uh, and then Tim is going to bring part one, part one of his talk. Don't worry, it's short. Uh, Jacob, why don't you come up here? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you for Jacob. Thank you for his heart for you as he brings uh, this, the word, your written word this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask again, come, speak to us and anoint us and uh, change our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Acts 2, 1 to 12. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to the to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazing and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? I'm going to hand over to him. Thank you so much, Jacob. Let's give it up for Jacob. <laughs> Amazing. Bonjour, buenos dias, konnichiwa, guten tag, uh, and so on. Godag, I learned. Uh, yasas, shalom, and so on. Great to be with you. Pentecost Sunday, and everyone is here together. The first miraculous sign of Pentecost was that everyone was gathered together. Jacob just read it. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. In one place. Say all together in one place. We are all together in one place. Acts later on in verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together. They were all together. Pentecost is the birthday of the church, it's the start of a new community where the power of God's love in his people draws us to each other. We begin to love one another like God loves us because the power of his love is on the inside. That's quite a high bar to love one another like God loves you. And no one is excluded from God's love. The church is truly Inclusive, God's love is all embracing. Nothing can hold it back. No one is excluded from the love of God. Not the most saintly saint and not the most vilest sinner. Even you. (laughs) Even me. If you saw the thoughts and heard the thoughts that went through my head, you would not want me as your pastor. (laughs) And if I saw and heard the thoughts that went through your head, I wouldn't want you in my church. (laughs) Except, yes, you would. And yes, I would. Because we know the love of God. The Bible promises us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God was poured out when we were at our worst, not at our best. This is the good news about Jesus. This is the good news that has rung out across the entire world ever since that day of Pentecost, where this great project of expanding the good news about the love of God began. And it still carries on today. There's no limit on God's love, no racial boundaries to it, no culture, no gender, no class distinction either. We are all one in the love of God made flesh 
in Jesus Christ. So the church's primary witness to the world, our primary task, isn't actually just our message about the good news of God. No, it's our love. It's the quality of our love. Did not Jesus say in Romans 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, Jesus told his disciples that some time before Pentecost. But they proved themselves not really capable of it until after Pentecost. They needed God's power to do so, and it's the same with us. Diversity unified by love sounds like a a lovely idea, doesn't it? Until you actually try to do it. And that's why most diversity in the world leads to division. But not for us. Overcoming our divisions leads us to God. Just take this small corner of the world where we live. The the wide BCP area. Do you know over 500,000 people now live down here? They come from all over the world. We dare to believe that God has drawn them here for such a time as this so that they might hear the good news about Jesus. Their lives might be restored and healed. In fact, in our prayer meeting before the uh, service this morning, Bruce Finney stood there at the back, challenged us to believe as we were praying, uh, knowing that as we were gathering in prayer, loads of churches right across the BCP area, the wide area, including the forest, the Purbex, the church here gathering to pray this morning. Bruce challenged us, could we believe for a thousand believers to be added to the church today? A thousand. I'll be honest with you. I was skeptical. I found myself thinking as actually... Everybody else in the team said, yeah, we can go for that. And they piled into prayer. I was thinking, Lord, I'm not so sure. (laughs) The Lord said, well, how about this? Could you believe for one in every 500 people? If you're feeling weak in faith today, could you believe for one in every 500 people who live here to come to faith today? If you could believe that, you're believing for a thousand new believers today. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. We must renew the excitement of this task, as Lizzie just told us. And the leadership of the church is getting caught up in this. I think as we head towards our 10-year birthday this September, we're going to find this is something that grows within us. God, not just giving us a new heart for worship, but giving us a new heart for the task of evangelism as Bournemouth becomes more diverse in age, race, belief, culture. To preach the gospel effectively, we must learn these different languages that we've been, some of which we've been celebrating this morning. We've learned a few and there's still lots more to learn. Uh, This actually is what Francis is showing us, painting this beautiful spirit-inspired painting this morning, speaking the language of art. I hope that speaks to some of you in a way that these words or these music won't. It will reach other senses. Let me ask you this. What language do you speak? It might be commerce, creation, healthcare. Uh, It might be politics, poetry, or Polish. We've got to learn to speak these new languages. Actually, you don't even need to leave your home to do this anymore, to reach others with the good news of Jesus. It's all online. All the unchurched young people we want to meet here in Bournemouth live their lives online. Do you know now, Aaron Gibson just told me this uh, at, at the back, we now have 971 subscribers to our YouTube channel. He said, Tim, if we could get that number ticked up over a thousand, there's like within YouTube, there's a threshold that occurs and it will then begin appearing on everybody's algorithm who lives down here much more frequently and it tends to then roll onwards. He said, could you encourage, all we need is 29 more people to get past that threshold. 
29 more people. Who here is not subscribed to the YouTube chat? Get out your phone and subscribe. We could do it today. We must allow God to fill us with a new enthusiasm and excitement. But it is our love and unity that will speak loudest of all. Let me tell you a story about the power of when Christians decide to love one another despite their differences, overcoming their barriers. The whole world is blessed and nations are saved. In 1892, Stanford University in the States, an 18-year-old student and his mate were struggling to pay their fees. And they thought, well, we could put on a piano recital and invite our friends to it, sell tickets, make a bit of money, cover our fees. He was an orphan and reached out to the great pianist, Polish pianist, who happened to be in town at that time, Ignacy J. Paderewski. I hope I've not mangled that pronunciation too much. And the fee, his manager said, well, the fee's $2,000. And they struck a deal. They tried to sell tickets and get everybody to come along to hear the pianist, Paderewski. And the big day arrived, but unfortunately, they hadn't sold enough tickets. They failed. They only collected $1,600. And disappointed, they went to the pianist, Paderewski, and said, look, I'm really sorry. We've, we've only sold 1600 but here, have the 1600 and we'll write you a check for the missing 400 We can't afford to honor that check yet, so give us a bit of time, but we will do so. Paderewski refused their offer. He said, no, no, you need this money for your university fees. He was renowned as being uh, a warm-hearted, compassionate man. And he handed them back the money and he tore up the check in front of them. They went on their way. Paderewski returned to his native Poland shortly before World War I broke out. And when World War I broke out, and the tensions were rising in advance of it, Paderewski by that stage had become a politician in Poland. And he was sent to the United States in a kind of ambassadorial role to try and engage the United States with the importance of Polish independence and maintaining Poland during the war. And Paderewski, while he was there, knew that he had to reach out to government, and he reached out to the, um, the, the uh, he reached out to the US Food and Relief Administration for help. And he heard that there was an influential man called Herbert Hoover who ran that department. And so Paderewski went to meet him and Hoover agreed to help and they shipped tons and tons of food and grains to feed the starving people in Poland. And a, a, a humanitarian calamity was averted. Paderewski was mightily relieved. He actually decided to go and visit Herbert Hoover in person to say thank you to him. And as Paderewski began to thank Herbert Hoover for his compassion, for his kindness for his generosity on behalf of his nation in helping his native Poland, Hoover stopped him and said, you shouldn't be thanking me, Mr. Paderewski. You may not remember this, but several years ago, you helped a hungry orphan who couldn't afford his university fees. That student was me. If only we would all be filled with the power of God's loving presence within us. That we would overcome all the differences, all the divisions, all the boundaries in our culture. Class, gender, race, society, tribal identities, language. If we could overcome those with the love of God, the nations would be changed. Should we stand and worship again together? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. I love this church. I love the enthusiasm of this church. 
971 people were on YouTube. It's now 985, 15 to go. <laughs> Everyone together was our first theme of Pentecost. Uh, diversity and unity in the, the love of God is a great theme, but it might seem a bit uh, tame. <laughs> I mean, not many reasonable people would disagree of how good that is for the whole world, that God's people should be reconcilers, peacemakers, unity bringers. But there's a lot more to Pentecost than that. And I mean the weird stuff. Are you up for the weird stuff? Or did you just want a nice message about unity? You can't get past the weird stuff. Acts chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In fact, on that occasion, the great crowd gathered around was, was so bamboozled by what was going on, they thought everybody inside was off their heads drunk. Peter had to get up and say, no, it's early in the morning. We're not that bad. This is the Lord. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The disciples had a life-changing personal encounter with the power of God. And we all must have the same. It might not be as dramatic outwardly. It will certainly be as dramatic inwardly. It might be a slow burner over time. But your life will change. The Holy Spirit is just another word for God. God gave the disciples his own spirit within them. Elsewhere, the New Testament calls this the spirit of Jesus. Previously, Jesus had been their savior, their mentor, their, their friend, their, their pastor. He died, been crucified, he'd risen from the dead, and he had ascended back to heaven. They'd been told to pray and wait for this moment when Jesus would return to be with them, but in a different way, a better way a new way, a way in which Jesus was no longer just outward, a single person at a single place and a single point of time. No, he would be within, in their spirits. And the Bible makes clear that this is a somewhat weird gift from God that God wants to give to anyone who asks him. It's a radical change. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is now living within you. You are responsible for carrying his spirit, for living out his life through your life. Peter, the apostle Peter on that day, immediately put the new power of God's presence within him to use. He saw the crowd gathered around, the bewildered crowd, thinking they were drunk. And Peter got up and he preached the sermon of your life. Razor sharp. It was one of the most powerful messages ever preached. No one had heard or understood the good news about Jesus before. When by the end of Peter's sermon, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 41, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, I know exactly what you should do. You should do what I did. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, us included, for all whom the Lord our God will call. If you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus, he's calling you, you. That's why he brought you here this morning, to hear the good news. If you welcome Jesus into your life this morning, you can leave that door not having any guilt in your life 
ever again, knowing that your eternal future is secure with God who loves you enough to have died for you. With many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them. I love this. Peter's preached a blistering sermon that's cut them to the heart and now he's pleading with them. If you are here this morning and don't know the love of Jesus, I plead with you to accept him. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, Peter said. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. (laughs) Beat even even Bruce's faith. As we read the rest of the book of, of Acts, the New Testament, we see that the disciples were actually regularly filled with the Holy Spirit that did this within them. Regularly. God's power in and through their lives. And God will do the same for us. He'll regularly refresh and renew this gift of his powerful presence in his life. That's what's on offer here today. Let me illustrate I had a little, I tried to begin a a list, counting up uh, how many uh, uh, sort of electronic items we have in our house earlier. I gave up after a while. You know, we've got two cars, you can plug in both the cars. Uh, Then there was the TV remotes, and then there were the alarm clocks, then there were all the, the, the laptops and computers, then there were those Echo Dot, anyone else got an Echo Dot or whatever else they're called? you know, scattered around. And, and then there was, I don't know, you know you, probably the toaster's got a battery in it, I don't know. And I, I, there were so many things, that batteries. And probably, I'm not alone, I would imagine amongst other parents, particularly dads, uh, I, I don't know why, this isn't a sexist comment, I just, I'm looking for some empathy here from other fathers who have begun a bit of a campaign about batteries in their household. Is anyone with me? And you know, these, these, this is a double A battery. A few years ago, I went on a bit of a crusade and stripped out double A batteries from everything I could find and replaced them with rechargeable batteries. And I have two bags in the drawer of my desk and they, one is full of batteries that are waiting to be charged. They're flat, flat, I've written on it, flat, needing to be charged. The other bag is full of batteries that have been charged, ready to use, charged and ready. Does anyone else have a similar system? Thanks, Chris. Feeling that. No one else, just you and me. And and when the bag of flat gets full enough, I'll pull out the charger, I'll charge them all up and put them into the other bag. And here, here is my bag. This is charged and ready. Let me ask you a question this morning. Which bag would you be in? Are you flat, needing to be charged? Or are you charged and ready to go? Which are you? Maybe you're a bit in between. If you're flat, you can plug in. This morning, maybe you've felt the power already beginning to recharge you and renew you. That's on offer today. Plug in. (laughs) And not acknowledging we need this, we all need this, is the first step to living life as it was truly meant to be lived. You must deny both your own power and your own weakness in order to follow Christ. Make your proud or battered ego step to one side. And allow God's power to fill you. If you'll humble yourself and do that, you'll find true greatness. This is the great secret that Peter and the Apostle Paul discovered. That life didn't have to be contained by the limit either of your greatness, uh, nor restricted by the limit of your weakness. No, it could reside on the basis of God's power, not your own. In fact, Paul was very aware of his own weaknesses. He had many strengths, but inside he felt terribly weak, terribly insecure, it's clear. He he speaks about it almost as a torment. And yet he prayed and found this. He wrote about it in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power 
is made perfect in your weakness. If you're flat and needing to be charged this morning, you are in a good place because you are ready to receive the power of God. Paul went on to say, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. (laughs) That's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is the secret we all need to learn. What things does God's power make work? Jesus made that clear. When he got up to announce his ministry, he said this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. In other words, I'm charged and ready because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' spirit in you will enable you to do the same things. The Holy Spirit is God's grace to give And there's a constant outpouring available to us. But, but, it's your choice whether or not to receive. The issue isn't at God's end. He sent his only son to die for us, to show us how much he wants to give. The issue is at our end. Will we receive? There's nothing more you can do to earn it. It's not really a matter of doing at all. It's a matter of, receiving God won't force it on you if we want the power of God's presence in our lives we shouldn't be afraid to ask and if we do that we can trust that we'll receive I'll close with this Jesus said Luke 11 9 and 10 Jesus said I say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you'll find knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be opened Jesus went on, he said, look, don't be afraid to ask. Jesus said, you guys, those of you who are parents, you're not perfect parents, but if your kid asks you for something good, you're not going to give them something horrible. He said, how much more then would would God who loves us give us good things to those who ask him? He put it this way, he goes on, Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who'll ask him? Shall we ask him? Let's stand and let's ask. Lord, we don't really know how to do this, but we want to plug in. We need a recharge. Some of you, you've been recharged many times before, but you've run flat again. That's okay. You've been at work. You've been busy. There's a recharge for you here, today, right now. Others of you have counted yourself out. You've said, oh, God's forgotten about me. Uh, I'm flat and empty. I've become drained. I've been doing life on my own. I've made some terrible mistakes, perhaps. And God wants to say to you, you're, you're not done either. I can put my power in you. Your life still has purpose in my hands. Receive this good gift that I want to give you today. Find the life that I have for you. He's calling you and drawing you. So Lord Jesus, we ask you for the Holy Spirit.